inhabitants of inland Australia in one of the harshest and most arid places on the planet for them to know that they had permanent access to fresh water and wetlands. No wonder Australia's natural spring systems became so sacred for so many. But when the lakes turn to salt pans and the rivers are sucked dry, where does the water come from? OK, get your head around this. About two million years ago, it rained on the Great Dividing Range in Queensland. Today, that same water bubbles up in South Australia. Think about it. The last time this water saw the light of day, giant hippopotamus-sized diprotodons were grazing on the coast. The Tasmanian tiger was alive and hunting, and Australia was the home of a lion called the thylacolio that had the strongest bite of any mammal in history, living or extinct. So, this water has been travelling at a painfully slow pace through porous rocks deep underground. Sometimes it bubbles and soaks its way to the surface through natural springs. At other times, we've found ways to dig down and find it. Either way, it is the key to life to about a quarter of the continent. We call it the Great Artesian Basin. how the Great Artesian Basin works, you need to know how it came to exist in the first place. So here it is, the past 250 million years in a nutshell. Back in the Triassic Age, Australia was joined together with the other southern continents, including Antarctica, South America, Africa and New Zealand, in a landmass called Gondwana. Now have a look at the top right quarter of Australia. Can you see how it kind of forms a natural dip? That's the area that will eventually become the Great Artesian Basin. Over the next 140 million years, huge events like ice ages in Europe and tectonic plate movements caused the ocean level to rise and fall. When the ocean levels rose, water became trapped in that natural dip and formed a sea. But when the ocean levels fell, the whole area became land again. When the seas drained away, they left clay and silt deposits behind, which hardened into impermeable stone. Remember this. So now we're back to dry land again, but it's not desert yet, and there are rivers crossing it. The rivers carried sand and gravel with them, which later joined together to form sandstone. And that sandstone is the key to how the basin works. OK, let's get on to the fun stuff. Siltstones and mudstones are what scientists call impermeable. There's no way water can get through them. They're like plugs. Check this out. OK. We've got our impermeable rock. We've got our sandstone. OK. That ain't going through. Okay, imagine our layers of impermeable and permeable stone deep underground. I'll demonstrate. This sponge is our sandstone, our permeable layer. And if you see the water, it goes straight through it. But if we put an impermeable layer, this frisbee, underneath, the water has nowhere to go except forward or to the sides. When that happens, the layer of sandstone is called an aquifer. So that whole basin area we saw earlier now has aquifers running all the way through it and has become the Great Artesian Basin. It's a massive area. It stretches from Cape York to Dubbo and Coober Pedy to the southeast corner of the Northern Territory. 
That's almost a quarter of Australia. When it rains on what we call the recharge bed areas of the basin, the water seeps down and collects in the aquifers. Scientists estimate that there's around 65,000 million megalitres of water in the basin right now. A megalitre is a million litres. 65,000 million of them would be enough to cover all the land on the planet in almost half a metre of water. What's the point of all the water in the Great Artesian Basin if it's buried underground? Well, the point is it doesn't stay underground. For thousands and thousands of years, artesian water has been bubbling up to the surface in spring systems that appear all over the basin area. These spring systems bring life to parts of Australia that would otherwise be barren desert. They are home to a host of native plant and animal species that have evolved in these unique ecosystems. Many of these can't be found anywhere else in the world. What's more, water from the basin springs around the recharge zones often seeps into natural creek and river systems, helping to keep them flowing when the rains don't come. The species themselves are typically locally very abundant in where they are, but their habitat is threatened. Um, if you lose water pressure from the basin, then you've got no more free water and those, those species will go extinct. There's also organisms within the, that live on the springs, um, microstromatolites, which are a really ancient form of life form. There are other species where the entire home range is a, a puddle of water about a metre in diameter, and that, that's, that's the extent of where that species may be found. The indigenous tribes that lived on the Great Artesian Basin were the first to make use of that water source. In fact, it was critical to their survival. The springs not only gave them fresh water, they also were a valuable food source. Birds, mammals, reptiles, crustaceans and insects all lived at the springs, creating an abundant hunting ground for local tribes. And the plants and trees around the artesian springs were used for food, medicine, materials and shelter. And the indigenous tribes were smart about using the basin. That way, when drought and hard times hit, the wetlands would be full of food and water. Indigenous people should be good at using the basin. After all, they've been living on it for thousands of years. And once settlers and explorers began to push their way inland, they discovered the spring systems too. But they didn't always know what to make of them. And in the years that followed, many other explorers uncovered clues that began to point to the basin's existence. Charles Sturt got further than Oxley ten years later and found springs along the bed of the Darling River. Other explorers soon discovered more springs, salt mounds and wetlands. These are all pretty good indications of underground water. Driving stock in Australia is tough work, but we keep on pushing inland. And at last we've found a way to conquer these harsh plains. The freshwater springs are the key to the desert for us stockmen. It's the only way man and beast can have a drink and keep on going. And don't think we're out of touch. The springs are being used as sites for telegraph repeater stations across the arid centre. But the thing is, the early settlers still didn't think the Great Artesian Basin existed. Sturt had this theory that hidden in the middle of Australia somewhere was this vast and mysterious inland sea, and a lot of people believed him. They were half right. The water was there, but it was hidden deep underground. And then in 1878, a shallow bore was drilled on Kalara Station near Burke, and it produced fresh and flowing water and nothing was ever the same. Asian age, and everyone felt invincible, as if they could finally conquer the outback. Industries that had struggled now thrived. The early settlers used bore water to run steam trains, finally making it possible to travel through the desert in relative speed and safety. Farmers sunk bores on their properties to help fight drought and make life on the stock routes easier. Bore water was used to clean wool before it was sold overseas. This boosted the value of fleece, 
and save money on transport since farmers were no longer paying to ship dirt. A lot of inland towns relied on bore water for their everyday needs. Since the 60s, bore water has been used to mine copper, gold, lead, zinc, uranium and silver, as well as oil and gas. And tourists travel from all over the world to explore the incredible landscapes of the Great Artesian Basin. This story is not just history. The Great Artesian Basin is key to life to about a quarter of the country, but it also impacts Australians from coast to coast. So much so that if it was to dry up, Australia would be a very different place. For starters, the 70 towns that still rely on the basin for their water would disappear overnight. Our beef, wool and sheep industries would lose about a billion dollars a year and a lot of us would go hungry. A lot of mines would have to close down, leaving the country short another three billion bucks each year, not to mention a lot of people out of work. And then there's the tourism industry. Obviously the bars that have to close, but there's lots of other tourism activities as well, like camel treks, indigenous heritage sites and the GAN Railway. None of these would survive without the Great Artesian Basin. With such a vast expanse of water under our feet, it's easy to get complacent about conserving the basin. That was the case when settlers first discovered they could drill into the basin for water. They got a little bit overexcited and didn't really think too much about the future. Let me explain. Let's say this hose is the Great Artesian Basin and the sprinkler at the end is a natural spring. What would happen if I was to poke a hole in the hose? <laughs> I'd have water over here and I wouldn't have to go all the way over there. But what if I also wanted some water over here? Now, I've got holes everywhere, but I haven't got the pressure to get the water I need. This is exactly what's happening in the basin. It's so bad that a lot of bores and natural springs have simply stopped flowing. And hundreds of bores that do flow are out of control. They can't be turned off, and they're wasting millions of litres of water every day. A lot of bore water flows into shallow channels dug into the dirt, which encourage noxious weeds and feral animals. And it's kind of pointless because the open channels or drains mean around 95% of the water evaporates or seeps away before it can even be used. Meanwhile, to make matters worse, a lot of old bores were poorly made or the casings underground are corroding so the water is escaping to the wrong places and damaging the environment. But there are things we can do. These days, there's a strategy in place to fix up the old bores so they can be used in a sustainable way and the water can be distributed more responsibly. This process involves what we call capping and piping. Put simply, capping is just like putting a lid on the bores. Through a complex tap system, farmers can turn the bores on and off and only use the water when it's needed. Piping involves replacing the old open channels or drains with pipes. Now, the water goes straight to the tanks and troughs without being wasted through evaporation. And it doesn't ruin the native landscape by encouraging weeds and feral animals. The government has committed millions of dollars over several years to help protect the Great Artesian Basin. And the states are all starting to cooperate. And let's face it, they have to. Each state has different laws and legislations, but water isn't going to respect state boundaries. It just keeps on flowing. So, any plans to protect the Great Artesian Basin need to reach across the whole basin. There's water now that we can use for development over a lot of the area. The only opportunity we have for development is the Great Artesian Basin. And that means that some industries that are just starting to emerge, like the hot rocks generating power, and, it, and some new mining ventures have some water, but also industries we haven't even thought about yet. If you don't have water, um, you pretty much don't have life. And in this area, being such a, a dry area, the local communities are absolutely dependent on the GAB and on, on the water discharging out. And that, that's from a human perspective. Our industry um, and the industries of the state uh, and, and for a lot of Australia are dependent on, on the water to actually enable them to 
to continue on and to grow. Um, one of the main reasons why this area can support the fauna that it supports, support the people and support the infrastructure that it does is because of the presence of this groundwater. And if it's taken away and, and, it, and it's gone, then you know, you've, you've lost that. The families that still live and, and, um, and they're living in the bush um, just wouldn't be here without the artesian basin. <laughs> Committees and sustainability initiatives now focus on getting everyone involved. Farmers, local businesses, state and federal governments and other stakeholders. It's great to know that people recognise how important the Great Artesian Basin is to Australia. If you'd like to know more about the basin, check out the website. And me, I'm